So, um, by matter of introduction, I don't think I need to introduce Peter Chan so much to all of you. Uh, maybe I would just like to mention that I think about four years ago in the 2010 Biennale, uh, we kind of stumbled upon each other, um, us building up our pavilion, and he somehow sitting um, in the midst of his furniture shop. <laughs> um, building it up at the same time. And I think it was the start of a very a profound friendship, so I'm very happy that uh, Bijoy wanted to come and engage in exactly this bizarre, um, I would say, duo talk, uh, as we had seen before, the difficult double. Especially also because I remember about a year after that, or maybe two years later, we had a, a late night talk um, just after he was in Dhaka, and he talked about how it had profoundly influenced uh, how he saw architecture, and he would stop doing anything in wood, and from now on everything was concrete, and he would cut holes after the fact. I don't know if that happened <coughs> since then. I'm very curious. Um, whatever the case, uh, thank you very much, Peter, for coming. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, Yeah, it was interesting, just the conversation we had that night. We talked about Louis Kahn. I think we traveled, you know, all the different times. Aldo Rossi, Robert Venturi, um, Michael Graves. And for me, it's been actually a very special relationship. Uh, I'm just saying that because it's not often that uh, you meet someone with such a depth of... Uh, I guess insight and just in terms of viewing and reading and uh, that's what I enjoy uh, meeting up with Kirsten and just even having the possibility of, you know, doing this difficult double. Uh, but anyway, let me uh, jump directly into the slides. So for some reason Kirsten uh, has paired me with Louis Kahn and I don't know what the, the rela exact relationship is. It's I have a more intimate relationship with Corbusier, who I hated till very recently. Uh, but that's another, another story. Not for anything else, because I remember in 1972, I remember every year we'd travel for, for two months uh, within the country from the age of seven. My parents were doctors, but it was something that interested them. So it was just about exploring. India was you know, fresh out of independence, 19... 47, so things were still the old, new, past, present, future sort of was of interest to them. And I remember going to Chandigarh. I don't know why I'm saying this, but anyway, let me share this because I mentioned Corbusier. And I remember it was 1972, I think I was seven years old, and I remember driving, you know, we had this little Fiat, which is this old rounded Fiat, uh, four of us in the car, and uh, I'd never seen anything of this stature, this sort of dimension, and it was quite hot. It was about 12 in the afternoon, summertime, you know, 42 degrees, I think, and it was just sweltering heat, and there wasn't a tree in sight. It had just been completed. And I remember driving right next, right up to the Secretariat building, and I just refused to get out of the car. I was just protest. I started crying, screaming, shouting, and I, you know, and so they tried to get me out for 20 minutes and then finally had to be driven away. And it's quite, quite interesting because ever since that time, it was sort of a strange, I was traumatized, I think, and uh, it's only until very recently, maybe four years ago, five years ago, that I finally bought a book on Corbusier, you know, in the library. I just didn't. And now I've intentionally taken a project close by to Chandigarh, so I have to drive through. And it's quite interesting for me that it's a whole new discovery. So it's this interesting relationship for me between Khan and Corbusier and, of course, all the sort of incredible uh, architecture that has developed over civilizations, but also what's happening at the moment uh, in the country. And it's, it's, I think, Andreas, we were talking about, we're actually at the cusp I think this next month where there's a, you know, the, the elections will be completed in the next 10 days, I think. And we, sh we will have a new uh, government. Uh, but it's quite interesting also because we're in, I think 
the entire history of the country is going to be rewritten, you know, a thousand year history, which is going to completely, at least in my view, or I anticipate there's, there's a, you know, impeding change. And I think this, this is inevitable. So anyway, for me, the interesting aspect about architecture is really about how does one negotiate this flux of time you know, and just this, this idea. Also maybe specifically in the region that I practice, but I think it's applicable pretty much anywhere. Um, so it was interesting, I think it was a year and a half, two years ago, uh, I visited Dhaka, I was there for a lecture, and then it was a Sunday morning, and uh, we were taken into, you know, the, uh, to the entire complex. And uh, so anyway, I'm gonna share with you just very quickly these slides, just to give you a sense. went through here, that's, that's the entrance, and then you come out of this end. But anyway, that's, I'll, I'll come to that. And I guess the question that I have for you was, is, what is the material that Louis Kahn actually built this project with? I'm putting it out on the floor. What do you think? question. What material did he build this with? Concrete? Anybody else? And again, this is purely my reading, so I'm going to share with you my experience and my personal interpretation of this, but go ahead. Anybody else? Okay. What if I said it is water? So here's what happened. So we entered into the project and we start walking in and there are a group of us, several architects and some other people and I decided to sort of make a slip uh, so that I could experience this on my own. And it was quite interesting because as I was walking through the project and we sort of entered at the lower floor, on the ground level, on the first level, and at some point I realized that I was already three floors high. I'd already walked up three floors. And at every floor, it felt, I, at sub, it felt subterranean. It felt as if the space at some point had water. And it's quite interesting because no matter where you are in this building, you always sense water. It's, it's this, whether it's the coolness of the space, you know, this, or like the idea of a dampness of the space, or the reflection of the water that has settled. And anyway, so this was something that, and I, it, it, even at that point it didn't strike me. It was just this idea that, that's quite interesting that every time you keep walking higher and higher, the, the quality of the space in some way has been touched by water. It, it, was, it felt like that. And then at a certain point, you know, we come out of the building, and I'm going to show that to you in plan. I'm going to try and see if I can locate that. Yeah, it was right there. It's at this point, and you see these slots right there. And I'm going to go back now. And so I just peeked. I just thought it was this idea. For, and I was walking through and I was looking at it. And every door detail, every, you know, everything, everything, just the, the floor, the handrail, even the expansion joint. He had seen every single thing. And I said, it's not possible. How could someone, you know, uh, be able to see this, in, this? And it's quite a large complex that there wasn't a single thing that did not meet his eye. Uh, not a single thing. 
And this was something that I was just imagining. I mean, this was a conversation that I was having with myself. It wasn't, you know, uh, and I get to this point where, you know, I was showing you that, that, that slot, and then I kind of peeked on one side and I looked through. And it was this incredible axis where this landscape, which was this sort of wilderness, and then I walked to the other side, exactly a mirror image of that, onto the other side, and then it was in perfect axis in symmetry. So it was this strange, uh, let me go back. Yeah, I was looking at, you kind of looked at these drums, which, and it went right through. So if you stood there and you looked to the left, there was a construction of man. On the other side was this construction of nature, and it sort of sat in the middle. But at that point, I think maybe, I, don't, I wouldn't say it's an epiphany, but it was at that point that I registered that it made sense that he built this with water. He actually used water. So if you imagine, if you imagine this massive construction to be a rock, and the marble, that's marble that's set in. It's a registration of how do you measure this rock? So it's X and Y, it's a sort of registration in the X and Y plane. It's basically laying a grid to something that would be otherwise, you know, an uneven uh, uh, sort of difficult sort of object to measure. So that was this idea of this, this marble, which you see in the entire construction, basically, there's no beam and column. The entire construction is an extrusion, you know, and you can see, you can, if you filled it in, that's, that's what would register you. And you see this sort of X and Y marking in both these axes that actually run through the project. Now, it makes sense. You know, uh, Bangladesh is in the indo gangetic plain. Pretty much every single year, the, the place floods, the Ganges. That's, uh, it has heavy monsoons, and, uh, and it floods. So that's when it kind of struck me that what if, what if, with this idea that he was actually stranded on top of this rock. I know it sounds absolutely absurd, but let's, for a moment, if I imagine that he was stuck on the rock on top of this rock, and as a way to find a route to get out. So as the water subsided, he actually used the water to cut through this rock to find an exit back out. So in a sense, he emerged, he worked his way from the top back down. So what you see, what you see as the water is actually the settling of that flood. Now again, this is the possibility or, or the possibility of an imagination, you know, of how different layers of time basically have been condensed in this, you know, in this very tight, uh, extremely tight time frame. And so I guess what I want to share with you is that it's not necessarily sometimes that it's physical materials uh, that we often imagine that sort of uh, constitute the making of architecture, that, that the possibility that it is something else, the possibility of wind, rain, sun, uh, and water in this case, uh, which could be instrumental in actually shaping or, or, or being used as a material to construct. Again, if you think about it, water, uh, so if he in some way uh, did become water, in the sense that he would then naturally touch every single surface in the building. As he, as the water, do you know what I mean? Water, you know, when, it, when a building leaks, it basically goes through everything. If you think of the Grand Canyon, that's, that's a subtraction. It's an erosion that's taken place. So just to imagine the possibility of that idea of transferring yourself or within you in a sort of spatial condition that in some way you move between this idea of a relationship between man and nature and a back and forth relationship. And I think that's, for me, what, what must have transpired here. Again, I've read the plans, you know, looked at the sections, the models, all of that, and when you go inside the space, at no given point in time can you ever experience, even if you know it in the back of your mind, you can sense or register the section or plan that just completely eludes you. Every step you take, it just disappears. There's no way to catch what you're imagining as structure. It's, 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 it's elusive all the time. Let me just... I'm 
And then it got me thinking, you know, when I, I have, I'm, I'm not going to show you IAM, uh, but it's interesting uh, that, and maybe you can look this up, uh, the IAM building, which is uh, in Ahmedabad, it's been, I think, now, what, 40 years, about 40, 50, 40, 45 years, and it's already in a state of ruin. So, and it's, it has sort of gone into this exponential rate of, you know, a ruin where the arches are broken. And it's quite interesting, they're actually trying to fix these things. And that's when it registered that he had actually devised these ways into the construction system itself, where this idea of erosion or the acting of erosion. And I'm using erosion more in a sense of a cultural or a civilization in that context, an erosion that occurs through that process of the evolution of culture. <coughs> What's happened here? Mm. Sorry, that's my telephone. So anyway, this is a film, but it's okay, it's not. Uh, so this guy is tearing a building down right now. He's about 10 stories high. You can see that. And uh, it's something that's of interest to me. I still haven't figured it out yet. Uh, but there's this whole uh, culture of actually demolition. It's all, uh, buildings are hand cut, you know, 10 stories high, uh, columns, beams, bricks. Uh, and everything is recycled, but that's a separate uh, sort of concern. It's not about the idea of being recycled, but it's about this entire craft. And it's quite interesting because there's a guy like, you know, you have the Freitag bags, I think here, there's this guy uh, in, uh, in, in northern Gujarat, and uh, he makes these bags out of cement bags. And it's quite interesting because he can, you know, uh, he can, looking at the construction of a building, can guess roughly how many bags of cement have gone into making the building, because that's what he does. And it's a sort of, you know, he stitches the bags and does that. So he's a sort of quantity surveyor, but just purely by looking at it. And he makes these cement, he collects these cement bags from these building sites. So there's this whole sort of, uh, how do I say, this whole uh, skill of people with this incredible innate understanding of, you know, how to take something down. So I sort of show this image, and you know, there's a sort of very famous line that uh, Louis Kahn said that you know, a brick wants to be an arch. And so I sort of put back this question that what if a brick is not allowed to be an arch? And for me, this is sort of interesting. Is this, you know, the way that these are like gusset plates? They've actually torn this building down, so they find the the spot or the points. Uh, I would say of weakness uh, within within the structure. It's actually a brick wall that's been taken down. I know I know it sounds uh, absurd, but I think there's a great potential uh, in in this process of actually subtraction. I'm just sharing this. This is something that is of interest to me. I don't know quite how it will finally transform, but I thought I would share this. And also in terms of this idea of erosion. Uh, again, this is a quarry. Uh, in India, it's a stone quarry, and uh, I think for me, it's it's a, it's an interesting time because I've come to realize that we can still build, you know, and not because I want to build that way, but there still is potential to build uh, in the most uh, sort of fundamental way, just you know, brick, stone, and lime, something that dates back several hundreds of years, and it's not that uh, nostalgic about building that way, but the fact that it it is possible and also, actually, more importantly, economically viable. So you have this sort of very uh, direct way of building. So I'm just sharing with you this idea of you know subtraction, where something is taken out and then that's been built upon. I mean, these are just shelters uh, made out of stone because there are no trees in this landscape. So they actually use these shelters to break for lunch, you know, to be in the shade. And then they leave these structures behind as they move through these stone quarries. So you have this incredible landscape of these, you know, different pavilions. Uh, you can see them all, all the various different kinds. Uh, 
And again, this one is slightly different where actually it's a process of subtraction and then it rained in this part, in this region and uh, it's, it's basically this entire bed is made out of stone. So it becomes this, you know, huge catchment of water. And you see these structures uh, in this landscape just, you know, uh, filled in. It's quite interesting. I mean, just the idea of, you know, taking a dive and or even possibly wading or walking through this water to get to these spaces. What are the similarities or the differences? I, you know, I'm, I, I'm just showing you these images just to put forward questions just in terms of how do you read, how does one begin to read these things? This is an interesting uh, image for me. Um, do you want to try and guess what this is? It's actually a negative of a building that's going to be made into a positive. Right? And that's how they basically built domes. The Mughals, you know, that's how they built the domes and arches. So there's this incredible construction. You know, you can see that. And it's got mud mortar, very simple, very straightforward, brick and mud mortar. And they make this, these constructions. And then you can see that acts as the shuttering uh, for the structure. And eventually, the this thing is pulled out from below. But for me, it's interesting that what can one actually use a negative of the building to actually shape the space as opposed to the positive. So you're actually using the scaffold, so to speak, you know, to suggest some other kind of space. Uh, but anyway, I thought, you know, for me, this is an incredibly, uh, and it was just, you know, an accident that we stumbled upon. Uh, it's, at the, it's, uh, it's the Humayun's tomb, so they're in the process, the Aga Khan is in the process of restoring this very, you know, large uh, complex of, of, of buildings. Uh, but I just thought, let me uh, share, share this with you. And again, this idea of, you know, how does one begin to read? What is the reading? If one had to build in this way. Uh, again, this is my latest obsession, this idea of, at the moment, I'm in, in, the, in a brick phase. And I only say this because, think about it, we have a billion, 200 million people. You know, half the population pretty much builds their own or the or the landscape of, of the country is built outside the framework of architects. You know, it's all either built by self-built or someone, you know, your neighbor or, or, or the town has a few people like the master craftsmen. And so I figured that we still have about 100 million bricklayers available uh, right now, or at least for the next 30 years, I'm guessing, and maybe more. But anyway, that's, and it's not important how good or bad, but the fact that they know, they know how to put a brick wall together. Brick is easily accessible pretty much anywhere and everywhere within the country. So it's just something. So the whole idea of, you know, uh, this idea of craftsmanship, because I think there's also misreading. I mean, uh, this idea of the furniture shop, it was more just because I had these guys who knew how to build with wood. So I figured that that's, you know, they were there, it's, it, you know, they were with me, and so we, the early buildings were built out of timber. It was just, and it also made sense because of the region we were building in. Of course, now that's not the case anymore. Uh, the studio has evolved, has changed. And, and in some way for me, it was, in, it was of, of interest that, to sort of open up the practice in a way that it's not based so much anymore on the, uh, you know, and what one actually has within your own house, but the potential of what actually lies outside the house and to use the resources, you know, even if they not, don't necessarily uh, fall in the framework of one is thinking. So in the whole idea of, you know, also uh, in some way exploring this idea of prejudice, you know, this prejudice of aesthetic that we, we might have or we have or we carry with us. So anyway, this is a house. Uh, it's a house for, you know, it's in Ahmedabad, uh, fairly dry, hot region. Um, and I just want to share that because it's three families, actually. And it's uh, Indian families, 
much like Italian families, are quite big. So there are about 15 people in the family, and they have guests and aunts, and you know the whole thing just goes on and on, and there are functions. But anyway, I just thought I'd share just this model, uh, which is a working model. And so that's one house, that's the second house, and the third house, and it's wrapped by a public space or a courtyard. Uh, we call this kind of architecture, uh, it's, it, they're called havelis, I mean, uh, H-A-V-E-L-I. Uh, and so each one becomes their own private domain, and then there's this whole other section which is the public domain, or the parts where you cross each other and meet, and so on and so forth. Anyway, these are just studies of the model. And then we used, actually, I'm just showing you, these are studies, or these are our working drawings, because uh, at that time, it was a lot easier for me to produce these, uh, partly because I'm not physically there often in the studio, so to check drawings uh, and do all of that. So it's really come from the fact that I'm always on the move from site to site, place to place. Uh, so that's why I had to devise these ways. But anyway, very quickly. Um, <coughs> So here the idea basically was, uh, so this is basically the cuts for the foundation and the soil that comes out was basically used to reconstitute the soil into a brick, but it's just a simple mud brick mixed with lime. But we then actually developed our own press to make the bricks of a certain size. Uh, and also partly because it does now rain in this, in this part of the region. It, you know, maybe 20 years ago, there was a different kind of climatic condition, but of course with all this business of uh, climate change, if, if you want to call it that, the conditions or the weather conditions are now changing. So we had to sort of develop slightly thicker walls. And in some way, I call them, you know, the, 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 the first 100 millimeters or the first 10 centimeters, uh, what's it called? Yeah, 10 centimeters or four inches is a sort of sacrificial wall. You actually give that up. You give that up to, uh, to the environment. Uh, and so you still have some, uh, some structure left in. But again, of course, this whole idea is that it, it erodes over time. It's not something that might happen immediately. Uh, but the entire construction really came out of the foundation. So I would say 80% of the building material was on site. No truck really rolled in. Uh, it was all, you can see that's the press, you know, the bricks that came out. Uh, and that's the material. And again, the way it was stored was, you know, uh, this was, I think, initially, and then they got stored around the periphery, so the whole courtyard. And the only instruction really was, the detail for us here was, you know, the joint between the bricks, because that's what, what actually makes the brick in some way connect with each other. So it's, you know, it was how do you get 50 bricklayers who have different skills? And so we had to find a mediation of just you know, looking at the joint, the mortar joint, and the speed at which they were actually able to produce these brick walls. So that was really the construction detail um, to the building. The model was then, they just would have to measure the model. So anyway, the whole, uh, the entire project pretty much emerges out, out of the earth. And this was in the first, and for, for me, I guess, or for us, what is interesting is also, how the building registers with the different seasons as it is being built, because this took about 18 months, just short of a uh, little longer than 18 months. Uh, so it also it does become a recording of the different seasons. So in its inception itself, it is negotiating time, negotiating you know uh, the different uh, environmental conditions and. I just don't mean, you know, physical ones like, you know, rain and sun, but also other things that are happening on the periphery. Uh, and I think that's also just partly just the, the business of architecture. It's just, you know, all the different forces that sometimes, as you might have planned certain things, might not pan out that way. So how do you put in a system or how do you put in, how do you build tolerance into the building? And that's something that is of particular interest to me more and more is, you know, how does one actually built, you know, tolerance where what we would call error, you know, uh, and I'm looking at this idea of error more as this idea of anticipating not knowing everything in the sum total of the making or the, or the, or the physical manifestation of the project itself. So it, it, there's always 
some room left in, in the project which is open for, uh, I won't say interpretation, but which is, which in some way would shift, you know, would, would marginally shift the process of one, what one would have thought about at the onset of the project. Of course, so the whole idea is you set up a frame, it's more like a game, uh, and it's a sort of set of rules that can continuously change. And again, I'm linking this back uh, to DACA because if you understand water, it's an aqueous material, it's liquid, and, and, and it has a certain unpredictability. It's very difficult to, in some way, uh, control it completely. So you, in a sense, have to work with the flow that it offers. And so the same idea of, you know, this idea of time, water, uh, culture, evolution, and that's why I said this idea of negotiating time, where you're actually looking at the sort of ebb and flow of, of political, I'm, you know, it's an ontological survey, uh, a political condition, a cultural condition, uh, an economic condition, you know, a topographical condition, how these different forces are actually influencing each other, you know, global economies, local economies, and so on and so forth. So there's this sort of very complex mix, and it's, it's not possible to unravel this entire, I would say, uh, mystery. You can, it's in some way, you can find a code. Uh, so when, I'm, when this idea of coding really comes from more from the idea of negotiation as opposed to resolution of this entire complexity of moving forces. So again, for me, what was important and how I look at Khan, or, or for that matter, Corbusier now, was that what for me was of interest was their ability to negotiate time. Uh, and I'm calling that depth of field, you know. Uh, another word for it, I, that we have it at least in, in our books, uh, uh, where depth of field is called despair. And why do I say despair? Uh, because this idea that the sense, you, our registration of time is not necessarily, you know, uh, measured from the time that we, we are conceived or our inception to our death, but that our imagination has the possibility of exceeding that measure of time. And so if you imagine this idea of depth of field, that's why I, I, I bring up, you know, Khan in particular, uh, was that he, ha he had the possibility or at some point there was a moment where he was able to negotiate that depth of field. And when you think about that idea of that kind of depth of field, you know, there's a sense of, how do I say, not a hopelessness, but uh, in some way you have to... I would say the, sensation, the best sensation would be diving into a dark abyss and the sensation of what that might feel like, right? And hence the word despair. And of course, this has been written by some very well-known uh, Hindu scholars, uh, Hindu poets that talked about this idea of depth of field and they, uh, they wrote particular music uh, that explored this idea of territory, of this idea of time. And uh, they conceived this word uh, where depth of field and despair were in some way connected. But again, not despair in hopelessness, but despair in the possibility of our potential to measure time in that sort of uh, frame. So anyway, I'm just going to run through the building. Uh, and for me, again, this whole idea in this particular project, I'll see if there's a plan. I don't think I have a plan now on this, but it was more the spaces that are in between, more than the spaces that are actually occupied. Uh, there were these void spaces. Uh, so there's a continuous succession of different kinds of volumes of space that in some way could be a room, but could be an outdoor space. Um, <coughs> So we just handed this building, I think it was a month ago, and there was a big storm in the middle. It was on a hot summer day, and some of these images are taken then. Um, but also for me, this interest of you know, occupation, this idea of, an, of absence, and in the idea of absence, 
uh, a potential presence. Uh, um, and this is something that I discovered more and more curiously in, in, uh, in Khan's work that there was a, uh, this idea of, of another view of another layer, you know, and which one and how you occupied these different layers. Um, So actually, my interest in this project is really not the program, or in a sense, there is no program to the building. At some point, uh, that this space could be n number of things. Uh, it's not, it can be, it can move outside a house. It can be something else. You know, uh, a dance hall. You know, I mean, you can you can rewrite the program, and and then the way that one would occupy these spaces might then in, in some particular ways differ. So the building has the ability to absorb, uh, you know, program uh, and program through time. So that, again, is something that for me was of interest. And I think the same with, with uh, what I understood when I was reading Khan and Bangladesh. Uh, there were air conditioners now all over the place. Uh, some spaces that were meant to be outdoors were now taken indoors. Uh, but the building still had the tolerance had the ability to absorb, and it still worked. So it wasn't about its pure aesthetic, but its sort of central core, or, or the very core of what made the building, or what allowed the building to breathe, remained intact. And I think there comes a point where, where if over a process of evolution, that one, as one begins to claim or capture space, there will be a point where it could shift. But I think for me, again, what's interesting in, in that particular Dhaka project was that just its, its, just its scale in terms of the ability to be able to capture that kind of space, you know, as the population increases, as programs change, as uh, the consideration to the place changes, it had the ability or it was agile enough to shift itself. Again, I, I'm... I don't know if this, any of this is making sense, uh, but what the hell, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> Again, here, I think the clients in this particular project don't really know the monsoons are due in the next one month, and uh, there are spaces where they have to, you know, park corners and, you know, walk along walls to keep themselves protected. So it's all been calibrated with this idea of how you negotiate different spaces at different points in time in different conditions, of course, based on your own moods, the people you're with, the climatic conditions that might be outside, who might be there, or someone that you're trying to escape from or hide from. Uh, so all these things are actually considered uh, in the making of, of the plan. I like this space and I want to share this space and I think maybe this is some beginning but of course we've constructed it and this is a and it's a it's a room that you you from the main courtyard you come in and then you go into another room but what I like is when it rains it sort of rains inside the room so you actually uh, it's a space that and and the door is sort of set right in the front so you know just the nature of the rain and how much it occupies that the ability to negotiate that or actually you can walk directly through or sit in that space. But anyway, this is, uh, and that's the space above. So for me, really the, the interior spaces are really, uh, fairly straightforward. They're just rectangular rooms, you know, with whatever furniture that might be required to occupy them, but they're completely dependent on what precedes it, you know, what, and that's what I'm showing you here. And I think what I do realize, or one of the things that one sees in uh, Khan's work is, is actually this in-between space that really is the part that is negotiating this idea of outside and inside. And I don't mean in, in an outside-inside sense uh, in terms of, vi of a visual, but more an outside-inside sense in terms of, uh, uh, what's the word for it? More our own tacit understanding, 
you know, where, where you can reverse the two, you know, what is inside could be outside, and what is outside could be inside. It's this idea of this duality of being able to oscillate between these two points that you're, at, at which given point are you in or out. Uh, and again, there's this continuous interplay uh, that, that one experiences in, in, in uh, Khan's work. Coming back to Corbusier, I just wanted to, uh, for me, Chandigarh is, in, is, is, is an interesting project, uh, and I only realized this very recently. Uh, and I truly believe that he was you know, a visionary in some sense, because if you understand the plan and if you look at the structure of uh, Chandigarh, uh, what's, what's interesting is that the entire basis, it's a, it's, a, it's a grid. It's a structural grid, column beam construction. and. Uh, so when I was, you know, seven years old, we visited this, you know, I went back and the next day and visited some of these places. Uh, and just very recently, about a year and a half ago, I did exactly the same route. But of course, now everything had been overgrown. And uh, we have an issue of, you know, terrorism and Pakistan and, you know, all the different relationships that we have with the adjacent countries. So it's quite, you know, security is very heavy. It's on the border. And you pretty much cannot get into any of these buildings. You're always in the, sp in the field, you know, between buildings. Uh, and it's not accessible. You have to get special permission to go in. So in a sense, the building is completely <coughs> strapped. It's been strapped in. Uh, but it was about 5 or 6 in the evening. And uh, it has an incredible sky, Chandigarh, if you, you know, where it's located. There's this just really very vast sky, unin uninterrupted sort of sky. And it was interesting that what you did experience were all the roofs of all these buildings. And that's where the structural grid breaks down. So on top of the secretariat building, on top of the law courts, that's really where what I, what, what I understood was where he built the egalitarian space, where it was the space for the people. Uh, so in the law courts, the public space is actually on top of the roof. All the courts are below, and the roofs are accessible. And over the Secretariat building, he has this incredible construction of these strange objects. You know, they look, uh, I think, inspired by Jantar Mantar. Jantar Mantar is this uh, astronomical device built in the 15th century that, that recorded, uh, you know, and that charted the skies. And it's quite interesting for me, or my interpretation, that these buildings in some way are mediating, you know, what's, what's, what's uh, mediating the sky and the ground. So that's, that space is still visually accessible, and it still provides a sort of a, a hope or a potential of this idea of connection between sky and ground. And uh, again, I don't, because I'm Indian, no, it's not some sort of spiritual business or anything like that, but I do feel that this idea of orientation, this idea of orientation with with that idea of depth of field, you know, that maybe this whole idea of construction in some way uh, is mirroring the sky. Uh, but anyway, interesting note uh, with the Khan uh, Dhaka project was the cap, and maybe I can go back. Uh, the last piece, which was the hall, the assembly hall, he died before that part was completed, and for me, that was the only part that I felt, or, you know, and I didn't know about this, but it seemed not to fit in. He had made some 11 sketches, and I think they picked his 10th sketch and actually built it. But I don't believe that that's what he would have done. And again, it's, I'm just guessing here. I'm not, you know, it's just a postulation of, of what I think, because that was the only place that somehow didn't fit. It, it, it was more a cap and if the story is true that he dug in, you know, so what would it, and it's quite appropriate to think that he didn't finally finish it. So he entered from the top and somebody else put the cap, but the cap is not his project. You know, and that's what they say that, you know, that's one of the 10 sketches, but maybe it's just that relationship again, that it was not meant to be covered. Just, I know it sounds a bit, I don't know. If, I, I don't believe it's crazy. I think it's there's, there is something in all of this uh, in, in the connection. And there was a great clarity. I mean, it's for someone 
you know, when you run a practice and to think that you can, one man can basically orchestrate this construction of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people and still have that kind of accuracy. I think it's something to think about. It just got me thinking, just, you know, I mean, we run our practices and you know how, how difficult it is just to get a door in, uh, into a threshold. So I'm just, it's just something that, you know, having, or in the process of practice, that what does it take? I mean, that kind of, that kind of clarity. <clears throat> And again, that kind of clarity can only come in if you are able to negotiate depth of field. Uh, but anyway, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that for the moment. This is a small project in in Mumbai. It's a warehouse uh, that got burnt down. I'm just going to quickly run you through this. It's sort of sitting there in the in the slides and. Again, here for me, the roof, actually, the idea of the roof, uh, because it had an A-frame roof, we had to shed the water, blah, 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 all of that. But the reason these roofs are also partly this way is right next door, like across the railway tracks, we have the old British Zoo, you know, built in the early 1900s and still there. And it's one of the last sort of havens of an incredible flora and fauna. So these large bats fly over this landscape every evening at about five or six. And as the building had burnt down, there was this pretty incredible landscape that had grown inside this structure, inside these walls. And so for me, one of the interests was that, can one provide a space for the continuity of, is that time? Is that your phone? No, no, it's okay. Just tell me when, when so anyway, so the openings are more, and that's just one of the many layers. I'm not saying it is the only layer or the only motivation, but it is one of the many motivations of how this actually tilted in, the roof tilted in. And again, Mumbai being a city of 22 million people, it's the only place where you can register the sky. So in a sense, you know, uh, the view out was actually a view out to the sky. These are just drawings that we make. I'm just going to run through these. It's just they're there. <coughs> but this whole idea of camouflage, uh, and so I think it was three weeks ago. So we have, I think, what you would call the, mun the do you have a municipality out here, like a like a cantonment, you know, the local authorities, and so they walked in about four weeks ago, and we've got you know, uh, a repair and renovation permission, kind of. Uh, and so they came in and said, you know, you've got new bricks and you need to cover these new bricks up. So they said, you, either you plaster it or you paint it, but we, you, we need to have you do this. And uh, so we basically had to come up with this really fast. And uh, so you see these guys basically taking coal or charcoal and they've rendered the whole, it's like a pencil drawing on the building. They're just rendering the entire building in brick. It just happened. And again, this idea of patina, you know, uh, or this idea of the force, because if we don't follow those instructions that these guys who showed up four weeks ago, we basically have to stop work. You know, everything comes to a grinding halt. So this whole business that I was talking about, forces and evolution and culture and time, you know, and, and this was not the plan. There was no intention to do this, but somewhere, you know, allowing that idea to come in, and, and it's maybe an anticipation, but uh, that you leave enough room in, in that particular detail, there's enough space left in there to absorb these possibilities. I'm just sharing that. For me, this was really the critical detail of the project. And in some way, it sort of camouflages the building. You know, Mumbai is, is, has this sort of gray patina because in, the rain is so heavy, that nothing survives one season. Everything goes into this sort of gray, uh, and this gray and black uh, pattern. So in a sense, the building is camouflaged. I'm going to show you Fatehpur Sikri. Uh, why have I shown this to you? Uh, where we, when we, you know, this idea of Louis Kahn and and uh, the difficult double. But I think somewhere it's connected to connected to this to this discussion. Um, this was built by Akbar, uh, I think, in the 14th century. 
13th, 14th century. And the entire project is basically built out of red sandstone. The same picture that I showed you from the quarry, the, you know, right at the onset of, this, of the slides. Um, and uh, they constructed this, I think, this project over maybe <coughs> 40 or 50 years, I think. Uh, now, what I want to share with you uh, in this, and oftentimes, this entire construction was never, ever occupied. And the story goes basically that they were not able to find water, right? Now here's a ruler, basically, uh, you know, uh, a Muslim ruler. He was, uh, who basically had conceived, you know, he had taken Islam and Hinduism and developed a third language called Akbar Nama. He was one of these extremely, he was truly a contemporary thinker in, in the truest sense. Uh, and so for a long time I've pondered this idea that, you know, for some, somehow I don't buy this. I mean, it just doesn't fit in that they spend this period of time and this incredible construction. Uh, I think, Kirsten, you've been to this, right? Uh, you spent, yeah. And, and to say that it wasn't occupied because they weren't able to find water was something that just did not fit for me. And I'm again going to raise this question, that idea of that business of depth of field. But anyway, I'm just sharing with you uh, the nature of the space, the quality of the place, and all this is just, every single thing is just one material, stone, all of it. And it's the same red sandstone, so beams, columns, slabs, floors, everything is one material. But I'm coming to the entire complex is filled with these. And I'm going to maybe connect Aldo Rossi and Modena. Because in my view, at least this is my thought, it was actually a, a city built for the dead. And the entire family, this entire, you know, all the tombstones of the entire family over generations basically are, are housed here. But it's interesting because when you walk in, and I remember this story, you know, again, on one of the travels, and I, there's a store guide, and he takes you through, and, and he sort of describes that water, you know, this, there was water that came down, and, and music was played. And, and uh, there's this one room which is, it's called Shish Mahal, which is, uh, it's, uh, it's a room which has, which has these little mirrors. And he, you know, lights a match and this whole room comes alive because it's all multiple reflections. And there's this incredible story about this place of how it could have been or, or was visualized to be occupied. And I'm saying that the idea that when we visit this place and in our imagination, we encounter this possibility of, of this life that continues to be there or could have been there. And it's that relationship between death and life. So for me, I thought, and I'm, I still, you know, this is just purely my view, that it was actually, a, it, you know, unlike the Taj Mahal, which was built by Shah Jahan, who was a sort of, you know, a sort of dictatorial ruler in some ways, and Akbar had a sort of completely different sensibility <coughs> about the entire culture of the place. And in my view, actually, it's, it, was, it was a city for the dead, but actually in, in life, because when we occupy it and when we physically go there, it's been occupied every day someone is there, those stories continue to reverberate, you know, of the possibilities of what occurred. So it's, it's, it's this idea that is in your imagination of how this place uh, is lived in, or by us participating, it continues to exist in that way, and that's the sort of re relationship. I brought Aldo Rossi up because, in some way, Modena. I don't, you know, I don't want to get into the particularities, but it has this kind of relationship. It is not, it's not a tomb, but it it is a city, and by your very our physical occupation, 
it continues the evolution. It continues that idea of depth of field. You know, this idea of you know how that to make a construction in the idea of depth for me is something which is very special. Uh, you know, how does but in that idea that actually celebrates life, and I think that relationship for me is very important. So I'm sharing with you Fatehpur Sikri. Uh, you can see just. And they're incredible. I mean, these 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 stones, these these tombs. They're just each one is very particular. Each one is very special, and in some way describes the personality of the person that could potentially be in there. I'm sharing this with you because this is all something that I'm in a process of discovery. Again, I'm weaving these stories purely for myself. You know, uh, if you ask me to validate them, you know, the only way I can validate them is through the idea of imagination and experience. But I do, I do strong, I do certainly believe that there is maybe some truth in that because. Uh, this connection of making an incredible structure like this, of this kind, this entire city, and to say that there's no water, for me, doesn't fit. It just doesn't. They, those two don't meet. So anyway, that, that was one of the postulations. I'm going to share. This is a project that's in construction. Uh, it's a weaver studio. like a, It's a working complex for weavers. This, the client is Japanese. Uh, but she comes and spends uh, a fair amount of time and now is pretty much going to have half her life or half the year in India and half the year in Japan. And it's not because, you know, it's, it's, it's economical to work in India, but there's also a certain reason that she's able to do certain things, uh, certain, uh, you know, uh, ideas that in the manner that she believes uh, uh, is what nourishes her, just her idea of, you know, how she would like to participate with what she does, her craft, if I, if I may call it that. So anyway, this project is in Dehradun. Uh, it's in construction. I'm showing you this image uh, because it's been visualized in some way of these different layers of time, you know, from Humayun to Babur to Akbar. You know, it's you know, pa the idea of past, present, future, and the idea of materiality also of the building. This is the building I was telling you where the entire project is being built out of three materials, lime, brick, and stone. Even the slabs are out of stone. Uh, the columns, uh, the structural system, some of it is out of stone. It's, it's, it's in the same economy of what we would build, let's say, with a concrete frame. Again, I'm not, it's not the interest that, for me, the interest is that we can still do it. So I want to exercise the option right now till such time that we can do it, uh, more not from a nostalgic point of view, but the fact that it can be done. Uh, so anyway, that's the setting, and of course, you can see these structures, and they, they're mushrooming every day. I mean, these, you know, a lot of these fields are now being taken over by the same farmers who, who live here, and so they keep their fields, but you can see the density, and I think another 10 years, this will get more packed in. I'm going to just run you. For me, what's interesting is that she has started farming while we're building the project. So the whole idea of the act of building in the same way as cult it's both, if I use the word cultivation, that to use the word cultivation for both. So this idea of nurturing the land, so the building site is also being farmed at while the construction is occurring at the same time. Now she plants indigo, you know, uh, during full moon. Uh, so the soil is nurtured, the plants are grown, the indigo dye is made, and this whole thing is a process that has started with the inception of the building. And this, this dye is something that they will use. You know, as it gets older, the dye gets better. So it's something that, that in some way is measuring, measuring the time of the building uh, or the, the time of this entire inception of this project. I'm just sharing with you pictures of, of the place. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail, but I just thought I'd share with you the sort of atmosphere of the place. And so the whole idea of construction as a process of complete, incomplete, you know, if you, there's a play on the word, complete, incomplete. Uh, 
But this is, everything is within a two kilometer radius. This is the river, you know, this is up in the base of the Himalayas, up in North India. And so I've sort of visualized that this, this is again like an erosion. So the foundations in some way emerged from the ground, you know, as the water washed through, you know, ran through these mountains basically, revealed some kind of, uh, how do I call it, like a bar relief, something was discovered in the soil. And then from that, cues were taken to, in, in some way, register some kinds of spatial conditions that, that one has to read into. So it's like more like an archaeology of the place. Uh, that's the lime, uh, the lime, uh, what do you call it, the lime field, uh, or uh, the lime kiln, which is about two kilometers away. So you have the riverbed where the stones are harvested and used for building foundations. Everyone in that region uses these stones. It comes from a two kilometer radius. The lime comes from there. And pretty much everyone in that town knows how to build with brick. So you're not then, you know, <clears throat> How do I say? You, you're not uh, held to ransom uh, by the constructors. You have the ability to sort of work with a larger field. You know, uh, again, these are all sort of important things. They're cult cultural nuances. You know, it's, things are not necessarily so black and white. Where, where, where I work, uh, you know, a yes and a no can be the same thing. You, this is the kind of the nod of the head, yes and no. So you kind of have to always be working in this state of flux because uh, any kind of closure would mean that you're actually working against the grain. But for me, this is very critical. I think in some way, Khan, and even Corbusier for that matter, understood this idea of the unpredictable and how they were able to perceive them, perceive this, and actually put them into, the, into their constructions. Because what you see at Yale or Kimball, you know, or for that matter, La Jolla, these particular buildings are, in some ways, very, uh, I won't say different. Uh, they capture similar qualities, but somehow something else has been embedded in these projects that, that were one of the later or the last projects uh, that they were. This is just all the research, all the different blah, 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 all the models, you know, all the doodads uh, that go into the construction. But I'll just show you the... I want to share with you the plan. Uh, it's quite interesting because we actually, the program has developed as we've been building the project. So in a sense, we started building the project and the program emerged from that. But certain things, certain things had to be set in, certain conditions were set in those certain games. But you can see different wall thicknesses, you know, at certain registrations. Uh, there, there's a sort of breakdown of the wall, and in a way, it's a square plan. It's a force. It's a it's a square plan. You know, four squares. Uh, so there's a sense of an ambiguity, and there's no program. In these in these spaces, so it remains open for interpretation. In this particular case, the foundations are in brick. We have to do it in brick. That's what's being built right now, because a month ago I went to the site. Um, I was at site, and I was told that the quarry now closes before the rains, so we're not going to get any stones, uh, which means that everything has to stop. So we said, can you get brick? And they say, yeah, brick's available through the season. So we basically have just changed the foundation from stone to brick. But the nature of the foundation below here is different from the brick that we're going to do up there. And I'll share some slides with you as we, as we go along. Come on. What's happened? So anyway, yeah, this is all the stuff that they do. Uh, it's pretty, uh, sorry, it's pretty impressive in terms of Yeah, that's the plan. And again, the reading on the site, because this was a land that's been cultivated over like, you know, maybe 50, 60 years. The guy who was, you know, plowing the field with the cow was actually the original owner of the land. 
and he comes in uh, he's brought in because he knows exactly you know he has a full relationship with the land but importantly what i'd like to share with you is really that we so it had already been colonized the land had already been colonized colonized by man and basically the 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 footprints that were left behind in some way were what actually defined the location of of things within the project because you know the way water moved through the land it it was a it was a field that it was a parcel of land that was cultivated so they had to use you know very simple means of you know taking water taking water out traversing the different levels so on and so forth and that's what actually gave the clues to how we want to put these particular buildings on site so anyway that's the workshop these are just something just thrown in for scale that's the gallery space that's a dining space that we've converted that and then that's the washing space and then that's the residence uh, so it's a live in workspace and eventually they'll have more residences because now they have friends from japan who want to come there's a portal and it's sort of as the project is being built the program continuously uh, is being expanded on you know and so it's interesting that how you know it's more a system uh, that has been set in place that can negotiate all these possibilities So it's quite interesting that you know there's a line out excavation farming there stones being brought you know us working on the project all this is happening pretty much at the same time Again what's important here was dimensions you know these dimensions are based on on materials that are available uh materials that could have been available and they in a way traverse this idea of past present future uh, the dimensioning system itself there's a sort of dna in the dimensioning dimensioning system so it ranges from 3 meters up to 5 meters and then how the systems might alter themselves as they <coughs> modify so it's it's in a sense i don't you know fractals uh, the idea of rhythm uh, of material rhythm of evolution all that has been at least in in a certain sense been taken into account but the primary premise of the project is that it actually comes from the idea of erosion rather than uh, it's something that has has emerged out of erosion again sorry this So that's our structural test. That's that's a 4.2 meter span, uh, and it's it's a, it's a 75 millimeter thick stone. So we're just testing this. Of course, this is a sort of loose test. Now, the videos are not working, but it's okay. They're quite funny. Uh, this sort of commentary going on in the background, which I could have interpreted. So there's a guy who's walking by and says, "Yeah, you, why don't you get some more people to stand on, and you can jump on it and." it won't break and he kind of walks with this big belly kind of walks uh, very confidently but yeah that's this is the material i share this slide and for me there's one single obsession uh that the brick that we're building with uh we try to find a gap in the brick and what we've done is because when you lay brick it's dipped in water and then set to make a brick wall the water that we're dipping in is actually it's a lime water with the crushed stones of the river so in a sense the brick acts as a sponge and absorbs the absorbs the lime lime is the only building material that man has discovered that actually improves over time and i i think they call it here calc in switzerland uh, i don't know what you'd call it in uh, in italian calce in italian yeah um and it's the only material that actually improves over time it gets better and better over time so this is an additional sort of fortification or a strengthening strengthening of the brick to negotiate the different climatic conditions that will be imposed on it uh but more importantly what we discovered in the process was that on a full moon night the building will actually emit its own light so these are just the tests and we've done this uh, it was just discovered because what happened was that there was a full moon we were driving past it was late at, late in the evening and we saw the riverbed 
and this riverbed basically, which I showed you in the early sli earlier slides, was it was glowing. The stones actually glowed, and they have a they have like a mica a, phos a phosphor material that's in them, and and when mixed with lime, they basically have this sort of luminescence built into them. So, for me, this uh, what keeps me going is just the potential or the idea that to be able to see a building that can emit its own light. And that, in some sense, is really my preoccupation. So I'm saying that really is the motivation for me about this particular project. I'm just showing you the, you know, just, just quickly run through it. And that's our reinforcement. And these threads, they're silk threads. It's a bamboo reinforcement, and there's this beautiful black lacquer that's put on it as what we would put like an epoxy primer on steel. Now it has to be bamboo because of the lime. If you put if you put steel in lime, it would basically corrode. Uh, I'm just going to run you through this. So yeah, that's what we set one of the first models that we made. This was about two years ago. And of course, you can see it's sort of evolved and that structure came in. So in a sense, it's like a fortification in some way that has you know, dismantled or which is again being assembled back. Those are the offcuts. Sorry, some of the slides repeat themselves. All the door frames are made out of stone. There are these stone door frames. And you can see they've got a cut. And so it acts as a lintel, as a reinforcement in, in the brick wall. So this is just the mock-ups. <coughs> the film's not working, it's okay. I just thought I'd share this with you and then maybe we can open it up for you know, a conversation. Thank you. Mike? No, no. Okay. Um, there were two thoughts I had in relationship to your presentation of that of field touching Fatipur City, Khan, Rossi, even to certain extent. One was perhaps form and type, I mean, which I feel is very much there, but you don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. So, to what extent uh, a certain idea of type uh, seems to be always there in Khan, in Rossi is also perhaps the reason why you interpret Atapur City as a city, because it repeats a certain idea or type or what you recognize as a certain kind of buildings. Um, and it's also, even now, very much in the last project you show, and it allows you somehow to extend it because the type is so strong. And in an odd way, I feel type seems to be related 
then again perhaps over Rossi and um, his modern symmetry. Um, perhaps you could observe that you somehow suggested, and, and we've been busy with uh, Modena as a kind of um, a city uh, very much in the Galatea's uh, passion but for the death. And then all of a sudden uh, you read your uh, calm connection and something <coughs> totemic, perhaps. So the question to when you read Fatipur City as a city for the dead, uh, there is an implicit symbolism to that, uh, the depth of field, the escape of Khan from his own building. Uh, there's something you carry with you there, uh, where a building is not just a building, I mean shelter, it always seems to carry within itself uh, the totem of something else, the way you relate with the world, uh, that, uh, the complexity. Should I talk about the form, since we haven't... Uh... <coughs> hmm. Tricky one. <sighs> Maybe I can I can use the project that the last project that uh, we showed and I think the form for me in some way emerges once a base once the base conceptual core is established you know so and uh, in this particular case in a sense it's quite mundane I mean it's banal in my view when I think about it, really, was that I realized that if I had to build here, one was that I had a motley crew that I would be building with. I really didn't, when I, and I don't use it in a facetious way, but I was really, you know, at, at in some way, these people that I, would, I was going to be building with were complete unknown to me. There was no relationship of any kind at all, except for the fact that I knew that they could build, they could build with brick. So, from that banal point of view, you know, uh, where I said that we have 100 million bricklayers to our disposal, uh, the form for me kind of emerges from that because it was important that I, was, I had to be able to tell a story to them, right? And so, it's quite fascinating. In, uh, and in some way, I was then referencing, you know, Khan, uh, the sort of regular brick buildings that one experiences along the road, uh, the construction of Fatipur Sikri, uh, and so as, so this idea of a commonality, a thread that sort of runs through, and it still does exist fundamentally in the DNA. And this is something I was very curious about. Uh, and so the storytelling itself, you know, how does one how does one develop a means of communication? in the building of this project, in some way then instigates the form. Uh, but simultaneously, at the same time, there's also a programmatic insertion that occurs, where it's the idea of the weaver studio, blah, 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 and sort of looking at the entire complexity of the nature of their working. Uh, and again, for me, yeah, I think I can, was this idea of, how does one negotiate transparency, openness, and enclosure? Because in some way they actually should contradict each other. You know, so this idea of fortification, uh, but at the same time, a lack of one or a transparency to it. And that's the idea that I had to then introduce this idea of time, this idea of erosion into this set of conditions. Uh, and I think the form then, for me, slowly emerges from that. So what remains, as far as I'm concerned, as form, uh, or form negotiating fortification, enclosure, openness, transparency, if you want to, however you want to read these things. Uh, so, <coughs> I think it's this continuous dialogue of how does one uh, 
perceive ways to fortify, but at the same time, be open. I understand that, but I see you know, all the plans you show. In the end, you show uh, today for me more than ever. You show plans, and okay, and these plans, especially in comparison with the ones that come. And I understand maybe it's not a plan you experience when you walk through the building. And I mean the, the field that you say. At the same time, uh, add to that Fatu Kursiki, and you you see a fascination for type much more than I've ever recognized. The type is there. I mean, the, but the type is. I think it, it, it. I'm saying for me, type in a sense is fundamental. It's, it's given, mm -hmm. right? It's not but something. Still, you make decisions on that. I mean, absolutely. Almost a priori before the negotiation starts. Absolutely, it's a system of priori. Uh, absolutely, that. And it seems like that allows you to read or reread what Pushikri as a dead city. Which I understand to a certain extent. Yes. The way you can do that with Modena and, and Rossi explicitly, perhaps, do that. It also it, it brings this idea to, to a certain kind of civilization in the last project. It's, it's kind of, yeah, you see echoes of many buildings when you see the central central building, I would say. Not unlike the, the calm Dhaka. Or not? Yeah, yeah. I, uh... I'm just reverting back, uh, and the reason I'm being silent just to collect my thoughts of how did this whole mm -hmm. physical shape itself come about, right? Uh, for me, fundamentally, the f I remember the first sketch, which is not 10, it doesn't matter really, was this idea of making an enclosure, right? It was, you know, for me, it's something that I, I fundamentally start from, yeah, and there's a typology, a sort of dimensioning, is, same way with when I see your work, right, there's a proportioning system, if you want to call it that, but it's a proportioning system that that is where it's between being familiar and unfamiliar, you found the DNA between an understanding of yourself and in relationship to what you make, so I'm saying, if I call that form, right, the, how, what do you define in the end, again, as what is form? Right? Uh, is it the physical object itself as the form, or there is a sort of molecular structure that is already inherent in the body itself that that is the one that is form making? Mm -hmm. I don't know if. Uh, yeah, would you bring the last one more than the first? I right. Yeah. Right. And through a series of <coughs> manipulations, you know. Uh, I'm saying between intention and between intuition. You know, you need both to sort of operate or crisscross or possibly run in parallel with each other, mm -hmm. right? But always with an understanding <coughs> to yourself, because I'm saying that space or time will only exist with a minimum of two points of reference. You have to be <coughs> the first point of reference. Mm -hmm. Right. Otherwise, you don't have space. I mean, it doesn't then exist anymore. Right. And I'm bringing all this into conversation. So I'm saying that that form that we're talking about, for me, as far as I'm concerned, it's fundamentally inherent. So yes, it always comes up for discussion mm -hmm. in terms of you know, like I'm there's there's a sort of how do I say a preference, if I may call it that. And no matter how, you know, I kind of go around and if you notice, it's more like a square plan now. While the building is a rectangle, I mean, the physical volumes are rectangular or, or, or sort of linear. They appear to be linear. The cross section internally is, is, is exactly 13 feet by 13 feet. What is it about? 4.2 meters by four, something, 4 meter by 4 meter. It's a precise square in section. And essentially, if you put everything together, it's a perfect square in plan. And... Uh, for me, the idea was that prejudice of a certain kind had settled into me about form or structure, mm -hmm. and this idea of you know uh, dimension and linearity, if you want to call it, which you can uh, it's it's there. But the, for me, this 
not a new obsession, but a curiosity of, can I negotiate a square, right? Now, does one call that form? Yes, it is form, right? But right now, for me, I'm very interested in this idea of a, the idea of the square plan as a sort of condition of status. You know, it's this, it suggests a certain kind of static space or status quo. Uh, so a lot of the work that, which I, which I'm soon discovering, it's this idea of a square and a circle. And I've never done this before, right? And uh, so I'm saying that the form, as far as I'm concerned, comes from a certain set of conditions of my own evolution yeah. in time, which what I'm saying is what allows me, allows form within me, or allows, it, it, it gives me the opportunity to create form. I don't know if any of this bloody thing is making sense, but what the hell? Well, I think so. maybe we should ask that. <laughs> I mean, seeing from the outset, it makes sense uh, perfectly in the sense that uh, if you look, if I look at your um, not so recent projects, I see a fascination for non-axial, non-symmetrical, uh, unbalanced, no. And I mean, you always try to find a sort of balance which is painful, you know? And then lately, I think there's, there's a shift. At least uh, I can see a shift. There's a, I mean, in a way it seems that you are somehow becoming a classicist, then, which... Uh, but what if I was always a classicist? Yeah, and I think you always were, but in a way you were... But that was my decoy. Too young, <laughs> too, too young to, be, to be conscious, too young to be... Sure enough, of it, um, let me say, to, to be able to speak that language, eh? but these latest projects are very much classicist projects. In that sense, I think it's easier to find a link with this idea, what, what you were saying, that of building can, or, because classicism in the end is about that. It's about yeah. finding a space in a very long time. Absolutely. Of just finding a space in a shortest fashion, whatever, no? And I think that there is this entire discourse on, on forms find a place. It is yeah, very I, long I, I find it interesting negotiating the square. So you accept the square, but you negotiate the square. I think that's fundamental. Yeah. Which probably we never do. We should probably start negotiating it too. But, you know, I mean, I think the negotiation is fundamental. Yeah. Uh, so it's... Are you open to that? Yeah, yeah, I think it's really important. Awesome. See somebody else, huh? Come on, guys. Don't tell, no? <coughs> I, I think let's, for me what's of interest is, I, I'm quite curious about this idea of what I call system of priori. Priori, yeah. yeah a system of priori that in a given set of conditions, mm -hmm. you know, that the system of priori is what can then in some way construct or destabilize that form. Mm -hmm. And when I'm saying negotiating the square is about this idea of between status quo and one that is dynamic. It's, you know, my interest really is, is to sit in between the two in the making of the form. I was wondering for a second now, I mean, it crossed my mind while you were talking about that, as, as a comment of what was Andrea was saying. I, I don't think a lot has changed. I think, as you say, it, it was always there. But I think it's true, I mean, or maybe, no, it's rather a question. I wonder, <coughs> when you were working more with wood, uh, there was a craftsmanship. I don't care about craftsmanship. Uh, but now I think it's much less so. It's much less visible. I have impression, which I think makes the form more visible, or not. I don't know. I wonder if if there is a, if things got clearer, because maybe you were never interested in craftsmanship, but you cannot deny <laughs> that it was somehow visible. It was there. Yeah, but that's what happened to the image. Okay, let me just... Uh, there's a reason why I say that we're bringing this business of craftsmanship into the picture, and there's a reason why I put this, pulled this image out. 
And that's what I want to maybe talk about, because I think that's the misunderstanding, because oftentimes it's the material that requires you to act or behave in a certain way, or for it to behave in response to you, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it? Okay. Rick wants to be an arch. Um, now the reason why I, I pulled this particular slide, uh, this this image, is that the attention really here is what the inst the only instruction that was given is that when they lay the brick, all four edges of the brick, that means the entire face of the brick, had to remain uninterrupted. That means there was no mortar on it, you know, sloppy mortar, blah, blah, blah. So what I was, so that detail basically in some way accounts for the variance in the field of the different bricklayers. Mm -hmm. Now I'm, what I'm putting to question is that given the nature of the material, there's a certain precision or imprecision that comes from the material itself because of its just physical, its, its physical weight. So when you work with steel, or when you work with glass, or when you work with wood, right, and depending on the nature of that material, its thickness or thinness, if you want to call it that, demands a certain uh, response, right, <coughs> which in some way, that response in itself is the aesthetic for me. Now I'm saying, would this be considered craft? It's for me. It was. It's exactly the same thing that I did with wood. Not true. That's that's the a priori judgment of a certain kind of craft or skill. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think also oftentimes and uh, yes, and it's true in terms of you know when you first start out, there are a whole bunch of things that are ongoing and there's an ongoing discourse. And for me, more importantly now, more so than ever before, you know, I, w I, w I, want, I want to get to a point where I give only four instructions. <coughs> Length, breadth, height, and a structural dimension, a multiplication, a multiplying structural dimension. I don't have that project yet, but that's the one that I want to use where the guy, and it's unfortunate that the films didn't play, but as because then I can negotiate speed, right? Uh, and what I mean by negotiating speed is just actual physical Greenwich Mean Time, time in itself, because I don't have to work a door detail, a window detail, nothing. There is no detail. I just, just say this by this by this, and you build it. And they just build it at a voracious speed. To then come back, basically, and cut it down, like, you know, I just showed you some images of that. Now, why am I saying this? Uh, and it's in a way, you're just describing Roman architecture, no? I mean, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. You're describing Roman architecture, which is interesting, because it is about the tectonics of what you do. It's about the material. It's about the act. It's about, you know, well, everything you say. It's Roman architecture or not. I mean, it's the kind of architecture where... When Bramante was looking at it, he might try to emulate it, but it was always emulating it. But what you do is not emulating it. It's just literally doing it again. I mean, potentially. What Possibly, you exactly. Not, not, yeah, not, not sure, yes. Not sure about doing it again. But again, within that, there's an inherent problem. So I, that's a whole different discussion. That's why I'm still trying to f figure it out. Maybe figuring it out is not the idea, and to actually just do it... Uh, so I want to use basically that system of craftsmanship, which I'm calling as demolition, as a means to actually make space. In otherwise, what where you're giving four instructions where space is actually closing, because I'm fundamentally building a sarcophagus. There is no light in that space. So you actually have to enter from some point from the outside, and then work from inside to get you know this blah blah. I don't know. I'm I'm I, I'm just. But I, I'm, I think also maybe just for me, it's, you know, I'm just very curious because it's just the sheer amount of variances that one has to negotiate all in one day. I mean, let alone one year and let, let alone 10 years, you know. So 
you know, can one develop an inherent system that can absorb, you know, and can you develop techniques or methods that can absorb these variances over a period of time, for me is really my curiosity. That's all I really care about. Uh, more so now than ever before. Uh, uh, go ahead. Say that it all sounds in the end very Roman and very Canyon, eh? because, for example, at the very beginning, you are showing uh, uh, this, this marble line, you know, yeah. the concrete. Yeah. And it's true what you say, that it's like a grade which is measuring this rock, no? At the same time, uh, if I remember well, no, he was even worried about the fact that uh, uh, the, the cast no, would have uh, not been precise no, there. So it was really marking one cast and then the cast of the day after no, in order to mask it. So it was, in a way, even measuring uh, time. No, this Absolutely. Marvel. And in that sense, even transcending uh, handcraft, no, because uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's there, it's very much about how you do things, at the same time the result is not speaking about that. No? It's Absolutely. Another, Craft is, uh, in my view, completely misunderstood. Yeah. That's why, I mean, when I'm saying that the way, and I think partly also because I just want to break this thing down about how I consider... Uh, and maybe it's an interesting thing, and I can I can share that with you. Because so I I don't have the team that I had over 15 years. They just there's a beautiful Jared Diamond. I've, have you read this book called Collapse? Yeah, and, yeah, you know, yeah. Right. Your big Jared Diamond. Uh, yeah. Right. Is the Jared Diamond. Uh, okay. So. Uh, <laughs> and then if you read John Ruskin, Unto This Last. If you read John Ruskin and Unto, have you read Unto This Last? No. Kind. No. Huh? No. Okay. But interesting if you start making these connections. Uh, and <laughs> it's actually a good read, but, uh, and the reason I'm saying that is because uh, John Ruskin talks about the idea of craftsmanship in the Jared Diamond collapse sensibility. You know, the idea of the industrial and the hand and the mitigation of the two. Uh, but also this idea of what those relationships are. Anyway, I'm coming, so basically I had a collapse which I already knew five years. So when we were at the Biennale in 2000, uh, and a year before that, I knew that this, what I was doing was, it was a sunset. It, it was a question of sunset. When is the sun going to set on it? Um, I didn't realize that the manner in which it would unfold was the way it unfolded. Now, it's a good point what was brought up, because my understanding of craft as, as an idea is about fundamentally only one thing, negotiating time, right? And one of the things that I, you know, often spoke to the guys who I worked with, the carpenters, you know, who are incredible in, in my view, was their ability to move forward, because as the same materials, for whatever reasons, would become more expensive or they were less viable economically anymore, you know, uh, and as, but, can one have the ability to transfer that skill into something of what might appear to be a, a poorer material or not so fair as a material or a material that doesn't behave well, right? Uh, and that ability for them to take that next step, right, is what I think fundamentally, you know, to traverse that step requires some other process, you know, and and that's why I said that the form then becomes a prejudice. Yeah. Yeah, if I'm, yeah, yeah, definitely. But that's that's kind of the shift. I mean, not the real shift, but that's the, the awareness of it where it becomes it's there. It was like this, there, now. this formula for you. I, I think it's really interesting. Out of necessity, as you say. But that's what I'm saying that, so, when we're talking about form and inherent structure, <coughs> that inherent structure, in a sense, is a given. Yeah. Yeah. And so if I'm saying that inherent structure is then necessity itself, mm -hmm. because to keep the structure alive, and I don't mean alive in the living sense, but alive in the experiential sense, right? And in, in what does that also mean? Because, you know, 
experience can also be one of neutrality. But that's a whole blah, 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 different discussion. But let's not even go there right now. Um, so what was it? Yeah, so this idea of inherent structure, and I've lost it anyway now. But uh, no, but I think the time you comment on this is right. I mean, it's, it's you accept it. Uh, and it, I think it's as you sort of tried to say, I guess, translating it with other skills where, you know, the material is of a different kind. Somehow I feel makes this whole process more visible. Maybe I can share another anecdote, and maybe, I don't know if you do this, but, and, but oftentimes when I'm working, I'm curious, or I work in a way that, do I have the possibility, or the work is done with the possibility that I can have a conversation with him? So somewhere he's already embedded. Now, you know, what do you mean by having a conversation with him? Because if you're saying he's not there, but that's not true. Uh, that, uh, but likewise, I would say with Rossi, you know, with you, with a friend, you know, it's 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 complexly lay It has a complexity of many layers of these dialogues that are occurring at all at the same time. You know, just. Uh, but for me, the 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 interest lies in that possibility of that dialogue, which for me also is the form mm -hmm. or is uh, responsible or is in, not resp or, or is instrumental in the making of the form <coughs> i don't know if this makes sense but you know I, but it's so yeah wondering because you, you talked a lot about the flow of water, the flow of time, and I was just wondering about the flow of sound in your buildings, especially related actually to um, the erosion of time and the idea that you have those sacrificial 10 centimeters of the brick that disappear over time. Doesn't that also change the flow of sound in a building? And Absolutely. But I'm saying architecture is one that is that is constructed with the five senses. So in that, inherently, sound is already there. right? It's just that our system of priori, as we know it, goes to the eyes. Mm -hmm. right? And that's the other aspect of system of priori, is this idea of what we see, as opposed to what we hear, or what we feel. You know, and so absolutely, sound, I think, is an instrument that is inherently built in. It's like a default setting that comes in to this idea of the making of the form. But it requires the five senses as a system of priori. So if I want to be precise in what we're talking about, system of priori, my interest is the system of priori of the five senses and how they develop a communication between themselves in the making of the form, which would be also the material and so on, blah, 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 blah. I think we have to finish with blah, 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 blah. I think it's okay. If you don't mind, we'll That's great. Thank you.